her third UTI, uh, and it, it is the same one, the E. coli UTI, and uh, just happens a lot with incontinence, that kind of thing. And so my beloved boy put in, I, I was reading online at Stanford, they did a big study uh, about bidets. And apparently they reduce uh, the potential for UTIs in elderly women. So he put a bidet on this uh, toilet we got. We did, well, not only did he do that, he installed a new toilet at the house of Placer Hills and put a bidet on it. And uh, I'm assuming that thing works. So anyway, keep mom in your prayers uh, that she would become more lucid. Uh, she is on antibiotics. It's called, anyone ever heard of macro bid? Yeah. So she's rocking with the macro bid. She gets all cleared up here in a few days. So our concern is we want mom to get over the UTI and to be her good old self, Lord in your mercy. And let's do a um, joy that Austin is just a fabulous friend of the world. We're so hard to help everybody. Let us give thanks to the Lord. And he is traveling tomorrow to go see his mom for a week in Colorado. He's driving, so and he always drives all the way. Long drive, so pray for his safety. Traveling mercies for Austin. The Lord in your mercy. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples, and I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is higher than the heavens, and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth.
his choice. And man, that gives me so much rest. It really does. So as we sing this song, hopefully you remember some of the melody. Uh, just remember that. And pour your heart out to God and trust in him. He's got this. Amen. Praise the Lord for that song. Amen. It's amazing how all of us can be so driven by fear. It really is. And as we've studied in the book of 1 John, the word of God says fear produces what? Starts with a T. Torment. Fear torments us. When we're not trusting in the Lord, we are really tormented. We are. And I've experienced that on, a, on a, a practical level a lot over the last year. 
Now, the context, of course, in 1 John was those who are trusting in themselves, trusting in their performance to be accepted by God. Of course, that's the greatest fear. Because you're dependent on how good you are in order for him to accept you. That's the scariest thing in the world. There's nothing scarier than depending on yourself to make yourself acceptable in the eyes of God. Because we fail so much. And God is a holy God. And he can't even deal with one sin. That's how holy he is. In fact, in the Old Testament, and this is where it starts to make sense and where the rubber meets the road, it says no sin will go unpunished. SOL, right? <laughs> We're out of luck, and I don't even believe in luck, right? No sin. And then Jesus steps in, and we all can take a breath and just rest. Isaiah 53. He was punished for our peace. And now we're at peace because he took all of our sins away and he made us right in his eyes. And now we can live a life of freedom and joy. But then we have the superficial fears, like the debate, right? We watch it. You know, I was just, I was just, I was shaking my head. I was shaking my head. And it was like, I finally got to that place where it was, it, it, mom and I, I looked over, and, and mom was kind of doing this. Right? Bless her heart. I was like, that's it, we're done. This woman needs to go to bed. You know, so, and, and by the way, I'm fine, I, you have to pray for me because I am finding that it is so much easier to just sit her butt in a wheelchair and roll her around. <laughs> you know what I mean? Instead of being patient and having her get on her feet and use the walker and strengthen her legs and keep the mobility and the blood flow and all that, you know. Uh, that was a side note. Anyway, but I got her on her walker. We walked out to the car and drove back up the hill. And, uh, and it, as I was going up the hill, I was just sitting there thinking, wow, I sure am glad that God is the potter. Right? Remember that old hymn? Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the what? Potter and what? Aren't you glad you're clay? Isn't that great? Try have you ever have you ever sat there and on that little potter's wheel and looked at maybe the lump of clay and, and seeing the clay get up and start doing something by its own? No. Nope. It can't. It's just a lump. In fact, in Romans 9, it says that we are a lump of clay. And God's this divine, beautiful, holy, glorious, compassionate, merciful potter who is just doing that little thing with his foot. I don't know what they do. You know, I've never done one. I'm sure Chuck knows how to do it, Chuck Borgard. But, you know, just molding that thing, creating the vase, <laughs> the vases, faces, you know. And, and, and that's what he's doing with our leaders. He's got it. He's totally in control of our leaders. I love this story in Daniel chapter 4. It, Daniel chapter 4, you should read that and think of politics and just go, whoa, what am I worried about? Why am I fighting with people over this who's, you know, on the right or the left? Read Daniel chapter 4, and you see Nebuchadnezzar, and God's like, okay, you're glorifying yourself, Nebuchadnezzar. You know, he would be the equivalent of like Saddam Hussein, okay? Seriously is ruling over the Babylonian Empire. And God says, you're going to be driven into the wilderness, Nebuchadnezzar, for how long? Seven years! <laughs> That's crazy! That's crazy! That would be like God, seriously, taking Biden or Trump and driving them into a grassy field, maybe over there in, uh, I don't know, what is it, the Capitol Park? I don't know what it is. But driving around, and then and both of them are just crawling around. That's what it was. The Bible says he was eating grass like the ox, and he was growing his hair like feathers, and his nails were super long. And imagine just seeing Biden and Trump just doing that together. You know? Maybe, you know, it would be so neat if, if you know, one of them went up to the next and went. You know, and they just start feeding each other. 
And God is just doing this. You read it. Daniel 4 verse 35 just warms my heart. It gives me joy. And then God takes Nebuchadnezzar, brings him back, gives him a sound mind, and Nebuchadnezzar says, God does what he wants with the inhabitants of the earth, and all of them are as nothing in his sight and like a drop in the bucket. And he says, and when my wisdom and my mind was restored to me, it says this, I praised and extolled God. And God can do that for both Biden and Trump. Amen? He can do that. He has the power. And we pray for it, as 1 Timothy 2 tells us. Pray for kings and those who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And he says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So, today is sort of an Independence Day message, taking a little break of the Fisherman series. It's an Independence Day message, and it's based upon one chapter in the Bible. One chapter. And in this chapter, as we prepare, it's kind of long. You'll see the history of Israel and what God did with them. And all their shortcomings and God's mercy. And that was under the Old Covenant. And then you'll see your own life. You will look at your own life and you'll go, yeah, God has done that with me too. God is in the practice, the business of being merciful. I'm so glad about that. Yes, he's holy. Yes, he's righteous. He's just. He's omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. All those things that should produce, should produce an awe, a reverence for him. But it also says God is love. And if we look at all of those grand attributes that none of us have, and it, he left out the part that he's merciful and that he's loving and that he's gracious, we would all just be trembling in fear all the time. But it's as if God is saying, this is who I am. These are my attributes that separate me from you, that make me transcendent. But here are my attributes that make me want to dwell in you. That make me want to envelop you with my love and my grace. All right, so let's read this together. I'm just going to make a few comments throughout the the chapter, and you'll, you'll, I hope you'll be blessed in this wonderful chapter. It's Psalm 107. Let's just read this first verse together. Okay, it's so beautiful. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Can I get a? Amen. Amen. Man, that's what keeps me going through the week. <laughs> that's, what get, that's what will get me to next Sunday. Right there. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, so. So. He wants you to say so. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> you know what I mean? But let the redeemed of the Lord say it. You know? Say so. Those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes finding no way to an inhabited town, hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. What did Jesus say? The one who believes in me shall never hunger. The one who comes to me shall never thirst. We're no longer thirsty anymore. We're no longer hungry. He's filled it with himself. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. You know what the Bible says? He says, and, and man, they should have really taken this to heart in the Old Testament. It says, sacrifices, Psalm 51, sacrifices and offering you did not desire, but a broken and contrite spirit. A spirit that just says, help, Lord. Help, I'm drowning. I'm starving. I'm famished. 
He led them by a straight way. Who's that way? Jesus said, what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Until they reached an inhabited town. And then Jesus says, you are a city. We've talked about it. You are a city up on a hill. That's the church. You darn tootin' were inhabited, amen? amen? Let them, in light of all this, let them, what? Thank the Lord for his steadfast love. Do you see that repeated theme? That's from Genesis to Revelation. God is love. God is love. And it's not just love. It's what kind of love? Steadfast love. You see, we humans can say stuff like, I love you. <laughs> and then our love, eh, not with God. It's steadfast. It never fails. There's a contemporary Christian song, his love ne never gives up, right? His love never fails, never gives up. For his wonderful works <laughs> to humankind. For he satisfies the thirsty, and hasn't he done that with us? And the hungry he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and in gloom. Old covenant, right? Prisoners in misery and in irons. Jesus says, whoever commits sin is the slave of sin. That was us. For they had rebelled against the words of the Lord. All of us. And spurned the counsel of the Most High. That was all of us. Their hearts were bowed down with hard labor. Remember in the Exodus? The Bible says those Egyptians were driving them with hard labor. And finally, they cried unto the Lord, and he delivered them out of Egypt. Amen? And delivered them across the Red Sea and across the Jordan River into that land of Canaan and the land of promise. Well, now we're in this new covenant land of promise. The church in Christ has filled us. They cried to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distress. He brought them out of darkness and gloom and broke their bonds. Right? Jesus says, whoever commits sin is the slave of sin. But if the Son sets you what? Free. free, you shall be free indeed. So he's broken our bonds. And if you notice the little translucent hand with the chains, do you see that? That demonstrates our freedom. Let them what? Thank the Lord for his steadfast love. Wake up every morning and do that, folks. Every morning. And as you are considering being mean to someone, thank the Lord for his steadfast love. And it diffuses that spirit. It absolutely squelches that kind of spirit. Because as long as you're meditating on gratitude for his steadfast love, truly meditating on it, with your whole heart, how could you possibly be mean to someone? Right? But the moment those ideas go out of our brain and we get inward focused, sure enough, ah, right? Our talons, our fangs come out. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. He shatters the doors of bronze. Remember that song, Reckless Love? He kicks down those doors. He lights up our shadows. He climbs the mountain. And he chases us down with his love. He cuts into the bars of iron. Some were sick through their sinful ways. And because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food. They drew near to the gates of death. We feel that way sometimes, don't we? Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them. Jesus is called the word in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. He sent out his word. He healed them, delivered them from destruction. Let them what? Thank the Lord for his steadfast love. Do you see what the psalmist is doing? He's repeating that theme. In fact, it's quite fascinating. The psalm right before it, I believe, Psalm 106, 
it said, it, every other verse is, for his steadfast love endures forever. It gives all these things about the love of God, or, or about the character of God and what he's done. And then every other verse, for his steadfast love endures forever. As one translation says, for his mercy endures forever. So Psalm 107, it's like he's following up on this. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. Let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices. Isn't that interesting? In the Old Testament, they chopped up animals, drained out their blood, and did all that gory stuff. And in the New Testament, Jesus fulfilled all that gore on himself. And now what are our sacrifices? Thanksgiving. We say, that's not so hard, is it? You know, beasts having to carry that ox to Jerusalem. He's just saying, just thank me. Just thank me that my love never fails, never gives up on you. No matter what kind of dismal mess you fall into. And what? Tell. He doesn't just say, enjoy my steadfast love and keep it to yourself. <laughs> right? How many of you? You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you have ever invited someone to come to the service? Right? Not for my sake, but because you want them to see the steadfast love of God. Some people are never experiencing it from a person. But you could be that one. Yes, of course we want these pews filled, but we don't want them filled just to say, oh, our church is huge. We want them filled so that they can experience his steadfast love and wonderful works. Let them tell of his deeds with songs of joy. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business in the mighty waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. He's just telling about people going about their daily duties, fishing, doing iron work, Electrical work, painting, building, carpentry. That out there. <laughs> there is, a, there is it, you can see now, there's like this cool framework. I'm still not going to go out that door because <laughs> it's scary. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind. You remember that when Jesus is in the boat and he's sleeping and they're scared. <laughs> they're frightened. And they woke him up. Master, we're about to die. Master, master. <laughs> I know that's kind of, that probably sounds irreverent. I'm sure Jesus might have snored. He was fast asleep. He's the Lord God Almighty. And they woke him up. And he says, oh, you have little faith. And what does he say to the storm and the waves? Peace be still. Instantly. The wind and the waves obeyed him. And what did they say? What kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Amen. Amen. What kind of man is this that even Donald Trump and Joe Biden obey him? And Putin and Zelensky. He's controlling them. He's controlling all of their actions and their thoughts because he cares for you. Isn't that beautiful? I love that. I don't have to worry about them. I don't have to worry about the leaders. 
He commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their calamity. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wit's end. Then what? They cried to the Lord in their trouble. Man, isn't that us? I'm at my wit's end. I experience this on a practical level. I'm at my wit's end. You ever heard of that word dimwit? Right? I'd like to be called a bright wit. I just thought of that. That's the first time I've ever thought of that word in my entire life. You know? My son, he's a bright wit. <laughs> you know? Joe's a bright wit. Danette, she's a bright wit. Dick, I don't know. But you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Dick is a bright wit. Carolyn's a bright wit. We're all bright wits by the grace of God, but when we forget about his steadfast love, we act like dimwits. Amen? <laughs> dimwits. They were at their wits' end. And it's so true, you know, Nathan, golly. If Nathan weren't trusting in the Lord about his car, he would be at his wits' end. Right? That's what happens to us when we're trusting in our might, in our power, in our riches, in our abilities. We're at our wit's end, and God makes sure of it. So that we cry to the Lord in our trouble, and he brings them out of their distress. He made the storm still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had what? 1 Timothy 2. Pray for kings and, author and those who are in authority that we may lead a what? Quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. If you think them votes and all, if you're trusting in your vote, but you're not praying for your leaders, you're still going to be at your wit's end. And he brought them out of their desired haven, brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. There he goes again, for his wonderful works to humankind. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people. That's what we're supposed to do when we gather together. Amen. Extol Jesus. I'm not here to promote all kinds of social issues. That's not my job. And that's not the job of any preacher of the gospel, to promote a bunch of social issues. We are here to promote Jesus and his love and take it to the world. Tell of his wondrous love. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into a thirsty ground. He can do it the other way, right? Thankfully, he won't do it to us because his steadfast love never fails. But on a practical level, sometimes when we think that, oh, my finances are secure, you can go, ah, let me make a little adjustment here because I love you. Fruitful land into a salty waste because of the wickedness of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water. And that's what he did for us. A parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry live. And they establish a town to live in. It's us. They sow fields, plant vineyards, and get a fruitful yield. Remember we were talking about fruit and that that fruit remains? By his blessing they multiply greatly and he does not let their cattle decrease. Mm. <laughs> you know, you think about it. You have to... You have to Turn this into practical terms in your own life. What's your cattle? Right? Have you been giving thanks as God has increased your cattle? <laughs> Holstein. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, trouble, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes. And watch this. And makes them wander in trackless wastes. That's what he did to Nebuchadnezzar. And I think we've seen him do that with political leaders who aren't trusting in him. That's what we're seeing. We are seeing America as, as they trust further and further in themselves and military might and money and being the most superior nation in the world. We, we see us just halting, limping, limping along. But he raises up the needy. The ones who admit, I need you. Lord, I need you. How I need you. I need you every hour. 
and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness stops its mouth. Accusations. Let those who are wise give heed to those things and consider what? The steadfast love of the Lord. Amen? All right. Let's sing, Whom Shall I Fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies. He's on my side, right? So Susie. Woo! 